Okay, welcome everyone to the next lecture on causality. Today we continue with covariate adjustment, which is like, a, yeah, that's a very interesting topic. And it also appears in other areas like econometrics under different names, but like from our perspective, like we give some, give it also some treatment from the graph perspective for talking about graphs. It has something to do some, somewhat with instrumental variable and these kind of things, but it's slightly, I, th I think maybe more general, or maybe it's my ignorance of the other areas that I would call it a little bit more general. So let's see. Um, we still f are following the book from um, Jonas Peters, Dominik Janssing, and Bernhard Schulkopf. So we talked already about th these topics, Markov properties, and so on and so forth. However, we haven't covered the causal minimality, so that's something we cover next. And after that, we have finished up the section 6.5, and then we deal with the covariate adjustment as announced in the title. But let's first talk about causal minimality, what this is about. Um, so first of all, the first notion we need to learn is faithfulness. So that's a fancy name. So what does it mean? So typically when we have a Bayesian network, for example, or a Caution Bayesian network or a structural causal model, um, we have a, a DAG G, yeah, and we say that um, the distribution induced by such a network or a structural causal model or a causal Bayesian network um, from the graph G is Markovian with respect to the graph if all these separations in my graph yeah, imply independencies in the distribution. Then we say the distribution is Markovian with respect to the graph if certain graph properties imply independencies. Now, of course, the obvious question is, what about the other way around, okay? And that is, of course, um, now curious. It would be nice to have like a one-to-one one -one match, but that's not possible. It's just too complicated, this criterion. You've seen this um, graph criterion, this for all, uh, oh, this, this separation was a for all criterion, for all paths, there exists something blocking. So that was quite a complicated statement. And here it's like the premise and on this side, it's a conclusion. And this is like there's some negation sometimes going on when you do something like that. And that kind of makes it a little bit complicated. In general, it doesn't hold always the other way around. Here's a very simple example. Suppose you have a joint distribution where every random variable is independent of any other. So it's just factorizing into the marginal distributions. In this case now, um, any Bayesian network, yeah, with any arrows, no matter how many I put there in, yeah, um, my distribution will be Markovian with respect to these networks. Yeah, so a network where everyone is independent of everyone else, basically all conditional independencies possible hold. Also x1 and x2 is conditionally independent of x3 given x4, and so on and so forth, since they are conditionally independent anyway. So in principle, um, the joint distribution is Markovian with respect to any Bayesian network, yeah, as can be seen from the product rule. However, these independencies, of course, they are not shown up in a graph where I put errors in. If I have errors in there, then there are some deseparations which do not hold. And for that reason, so the any graph is not faithful, or the distribution is not faithful with, with respect to a graph where there are errors in. Okay, oh, the, I already had the definition. No, I'm just saying, so the, the other way around doesn't work for this distribution. Yeah. So in general, it doesn't hold for any graph. So the thing is, I can add always arrows to a Bayesian network without introducing new independencies, right? If I add an arrow, what happens? I have more path. And so if I have more path, then there are more possibilities to have deseparation. Okay, so adding arrows is always easily possible without violating that the distribution is Markovian with respect to a graph. However, um, it will destroy the other way around when I add arrows in a network. So here's the definition. If that is the case, so if um, an independency also implies a deseparation in the graph, then we would say that P is faithful with respect to this graph G. So it's like the opposite of being Markovian, right? P is Markovian with respect to G if we have the other way around implication, and P is faithful if an independency applies a deseparation in the graph. Okay, so that's faithfulness. Um, yeah, as I said, it's the opposite. So 
how can I violate the faithfulness? We've seen already an example, so we can add arrows. So that's a simple one, right? And note that adding arrows doesn't destroy the Markovian property, right? Because um, it just reduces the number of deseparations that I have if I add arrows. And so basically, if I'm saying Markovian means that for all subset A and B, if I have deseparation, I have independence. Um, if I now add arrows, then the number of deseparations that I can find in the graph decreases. And so all that, that there were before, they will be there before, but maybe if I have a particular area at a certain location, some might disappear. However, the distribution might still have this independence, but that's not a problem for being Markovian. But it is a problem for faithfulness. Okay? So there's another way, and that is called parameter tuning. And this is an example copied from the book. <coughs> so consider this graph, G1, yeah, where we have a distribution for x. Suppose it's just some noise distribution, and we have a distribution for y, which is like a times x plus some further noise, and then we have z being a function of x and y, where we have certain constants here, b and c. So this is a structural causal model defined along this graph g1. Okay. So now, how can I tune the parameters to get independencies? If a times b plus c is equal to 0, then just what's happened, the information passing from x via y to z is canceling out with the information going directly. So this is an example of a linear model. And if I plug in the x, uh, uh, if I plug in the y into the description of the z, yeah, then you will see that the x appears with a a times b in front of it. And I can drag out the x. And so if a times b plus c is equal to 0, then basically the x does not depend on the z. Okay, so I can choose the parameter, I can tune them such, such that x and z are independent. And so for that reason, the joint distribution originating from this choice of parameters is not faithful with respect to G1. Okay, however, one can show um, that we can also have a different definition where we get the same joint, joint distribution at the end, but it's going along this graph. And so um, it, it will be then, I think, faithful with respect to this graph. Yeah, but it's a different one. And it's quite tricky because we also turned around here some arrows. There's a longer discussion of these examples also about this graph H, which is, which is a super graph of G2 um, in the book. But this should just uh, show that there are different ways to violate the faithfulness. So it's a nice property that you might want to have, right? But it's not easily obtainable always. And um, so why is it like important? Because um, if we are looking for graphs um, given a distribution, so you have some data, and that implies a certain observed distribution, of course, we would like to find a faithful graph, so a graph which really describes what's going on. We are not happy with just a graph where we put all errors in. That's always the, the trivial one, but we want to have one which is kind of minimal in some sense. Okay, And for that, it needs to be faithful. However, as you can see, it's quite tricky with the arrows. Also, the direction of the arrows here plays a role, but we are not going into further detail here. So let's move on to causal minimality, which is actually capturing that one. So we say that a distribution satisfies causal minimality with respect to a graph if it is Markovian with respect to this graph. So that's like one thing. So the deseparatedness should imply independence. Um, but it's not Markovian with respect to any proper subgraph of G. So if I remove an edge from G, then my distribution is not any more Markovian. And then there's a theorem. If I'm faithful and Markovian with respect to a graph, then causal minimality is satisfied as well. Okay, and this can be proved. Um, here's a, excuse me, a proof that I copied from the book. So suppose my distribution is Markovian and let's assume it's Markovian with respect to a proper subgraph of G, okay? And that basically means, let's suppose causal minimality is, uh, I know, I, I want to prove that causal minimality uh, must hold if I'm faithful in Markovian with respect to G. So if then causal minimality holds, then it should be um, Markovian with respect to a proper subgraph. So let's assume that it's um, Markovian with respect to a proper subgraph, and then we show that one of these things is violated. So if it's 
Markovian with respect to a proper subgraph, there must exist node x and y that are linked in G, but not in G prime. Okay, so it's, if it's a subgraph, right, there must be one edge that I omitted. Okay, and um, curiously, if I have two nodes in a graph that ha don't have a direct link, I can always find a blocking set. Okay, let's see why that's the case, and let's let's use uh, the board again. So let me see how I can switch off this thing so that it works. Nice. So suppose I'm having a large graph, and here's no link between them, right? There could be different possibilities. So they could look like this, for example. So that could be a path. Such a path is blocked without observing Z. So nothing to do here. There could be other things, paths like that. So here I could um, say they are separable by observing A. Okay, so I can give a subset of the other nodes such that they are separated. It could be also the other way around, like a setup like that one. Any other things that I kind of have are special cases, right? It could be anything like this. I could also have a graph where I'm having like incoming edges, but then I'm again in this destructure type of thing and this pass is blocked. So if there's no direct connection, there is always some subset such that they are blockable, okay? And this is the end of the blackboard, okay, fine. So I need to be between those two lines. I think that's what's kind of visible in the video. So they can be deseparated by, by some set in G prime. Oh, I better switch it on again. So since I assume that it's Markovian with respect to G prime, it implies that there, there must be an independence in P, right? However, this independence is not implied by G because there was an edge between X and Y, okay? So I'm shown that it's P cannot be faithful with respect to um, this graph G. So I have an assumption here and another assumption, and I, then I, if I assume the opposite of causal minimality, one of them must be wrong, okay? So it's like a proof sketch. It's not completely rigorous, but it gives the idea. Um, there's also some other equivalent formulation of causal minimality. So um, suppose uh, we have a distribution that is Markovian with respect to a graph. If it uh, satisfies causal minimality, then one can show that this is if and only the case if now comes some complicated weird thing, but Let's first read what Jonas Peters wrote in his book, all the parents are active, which basically mean you are dependent with each of your parents, okay? And since this is a for all statement for all nodes, so for any nodes in the graph, you kind of have some dependency with your parents. So you cannot omit a graph, uh, and no, um, you cannot omit an error from your parents to yourself. And by this, we can talk about all errors in the graph because you can just pick any of the nodes with an incoming error, and then you can talk about the parents. So what is the precise statement? So basically, the precise statement is xj and one of the parents, they are never independent given the other parents. Okay, so that is a technical statement. It is quite technical. And you see also, the reasoning here, um, yeah, it's it's quite complicated. So this deseparation definition is reasonably complicated to get get some some weird definitions. Also, the faithfulness thing is kind of intuitive with the other way around, but adding errors and removing errors, so there's it's not very intuitive, I think. So these um, you always have to look at the definitions when you want to make these kind of statements. I also find it confusing often. Okay, but then there are like equivalent things. Um, important thing is causal minimality. Uh, I think is it's stronger than faithfulness or something. So there are some statements about what is a stronger statement, and one is stronger than the other. And I hope I said the right thing. But I refer to the book from from Peters. Anyway, so the um, summary here is the relationship between the distribution and the graphs is complicated. So that is a that is a summary. However, there is an interesting relationship. 
Um, so in the graph, there's a deseparation property, and on the probability distributions, there's a conditional independent uh, property, and so there are relationships between them. And the definitions like faithfulness and causal minimality, we can do them, and we can just define what we mean, and then we can have some interesting theorems about it, but the basic notions here that are like essential are on the distribution level, the conditional independencies, and on the graph level, the um, the separation criterion. So those are the basic notions and everything else is derived from them, all the other notions. Okay. So far so good. Um, let's move on to the next to topic, which is called covariate adjustment. And as a motivation, um, our goal is to find out whether smoking causes cancer. Okay, so that is the goal of our chapter here. So we have a random variable whether a person smokes and then whether a person has cancer. And in a way, it looks obvious to us today that smoking causes cancer. However, for a long time, the tobacco industry was claiming, no, no, there's a certain gene out there. So there's a gene in your DNA. And that kind of makes you more a hedonistic person or something. And then you enjoy maybe smoking and whatever that means. And it also could create cancer. So, but the smoking is not the cause of cancer, but this gene is. So there's a common cause. And of course, um, you can't find out, right, without like forcing people to smoke and then seeing whether they are more likely to get cancer. But this is an unethical experiment, so you can't do it. You can do it with mice or with rats. And there, of course, it's the case, right, that rats and mice, they get cancer when they smoke a lot. Um, but then people say, well, this is a mouse model, and it's a model, so it doesn't tell us anything about the human being. So the highly paid lawyers of these tobacco companies, they found statistical ways of saying, yeah, there could be a common cause which is causing both. And we cannot exclude this one, so you can't sue us, okay, for getting cancer. And now the question is, can we find a way to, um, from observational data, to, uh, to solve this question whether smoking um, produces cancer. And with a trick, there is a way to do it. And we have enough formalism now to possibly write something down like that. So as I said, interventions, which would be a randomized experiment, are unethical, so we don't want to do it. And the question will be, can we calculate the distribution of y given that we set x to a particular value? So that is the question, right? It's not about whatever, maybe your parents smoked and it makes you more likely to smoke as well and it makes you also to have the same illnesses as your parents and so on and so forth. How can we distinguish it? And this is quite exciting that this is possible with some mathematical calculus. Um, here's another example which shows that there could be quite complicated models and I'm not going into great detail here. The goal is to derive such a graph like this where... Um, I explain in a second what the variables mean or what the story is. But here are some variables which are unobserved. The Z0 and the B are unobserved. That's why we have these, these errors which are like dashed. And only where we have these errors, these massive errors, that's where we have observed data. And this is like the domain knowledge from some expert. So for example, here's the story. Let's start simple. So we are now in agriculture, and we want to have as, as much oat as possible, hafer flocken, I think, in German. So we want to have hafer. And the question is whether we specially prepare the ground before bringing out the, the oat, OK? And we know already that there are certain worms. And it looks like our special preparation is for getting rid of these worms so that the worms are not eating our oat, OK? So that's the I think approximately the story. It's an older story due to Cochrane S. Pearl writes in his book, and he also quotes Weiner for that. So looks like Pearl, I'm quoting Pearl, Pearl quotes Weiner, and Weiner is probably quoting some Cochrane for the story here. So here in principle to find out whether this ground preparation is doing any good for the um, outcome of the O that gets harvested, we should do a randomized test However, the farmers, they don't like this, so they have their own strategies of doing their tricks. So we only have observational data. However, there are more variables we can observe, and so here are more variables we observe. So down here are the variables that we've just seen. So this is whether we did a treatment or not. Um, 
this is the number of worms after the treatment. So I could go out there as a researcher and could say, okay, I asked the farmer, so did you do a treatment? Yes or no? Great. And then I count the worm on some worms on some square meter or something to get some data. And then after um, harvesting everything, then I can ask the farmer, so how was it? And so I get my data. However, there's more data I can get. I can also count the worms before the ground preparation. So that might be an interesting information as well. And I can also count the number of worms at the end of the season. And now from my expert knowledge, I know that the number of worms probably um, will tell me whether my harvest was good, but possibly also there might be a direct effect. Maybe the chemicals are bad for the oat or something. And maybe the number of worms at the end is also telling me something. However, there are other interesting variables, some of which I might um, not be able to see. So there might be the number of worms last year. And this variable might influence whether the farmer is bringing out like this um, special treatment or not. And the number of worms last year might also influence the number of worms this year. It might also influence the number of birds, and the number of birds might also influence how many worms I have. So now why do I show you this one? So this is another model where here causal inference means I go to an expert, we draw a diagram, and then we, as a statistician, I would think about, so what measurements should I do? And then I can ask the question, so is it possible to calculate P of Y given do X? Is that possible from the observed variables? And this can be then read off from the graph with covariate adjustment or with some other things. Notice also here that the unobserved variables so far in our um, structural causal models were these noise variables, and they were unobserved, but they were also assumed to be independent of each other. However, in this case, they are dependent of each other, right? So the Z0 and the B are dependent of each other. So it's a bit more complicated. And for that, um, we have some new words, and those are words from Perl, what, what he calls it. So suppose um, we are in, the, in a structural causal model with some graph, yeah, but I haven't said anything about the noise variable, whether they're independent or not. And then depending on whether they are independent of each other, so whether the noise distribution is perfectly factorizing or not, I would call my graph, um, uh, I would call my model Markovian or semi-Markovian, okay? And those are just vocabulary that Perl is using. So if it's Markovian, then all my unobserved variables are independent. If they are not independent, like in these oat crops example that I just showed you, they are called semi-Markovians, and those are just words to distinguish. We've seen already, okay, this is just what I've just said, We've seen already um, the typical definition for structural causal, model, causal models in Peter's book um, defines basically Markovian models because we are assuming that all noise variables are independent. However, when we have a counterfactual structural causal model, we have observed some of the observables, and this is implying conditional distributions on the noise variables and typically making them dependent. Okay, so... In a counterfactual structural causal model, the noise variables are dependent. So those are actually semi-Markovian. Okay, those are examples how to use these definitions. Also, the question is, so what is the relationship to this Markov property that we've just seen? And they are related. So a Markovian model is Markov with respect to the graph of the observables. So that's something one can prove. Um, a semi-Markovian model is not always Markov with respect to the graph. And here's a simple example. So this is a structural causal model where I have a noise variable u1 generating x1 and u2 generating x2. However, let's assume there's a, a dependence from u1 to u2. In that case, um, on the graph, g, the x1 and the x2, like they look independent. There's no direct connection bet between it, but there is a hidden path along the unobservable variables. And so for that reason, they are uh, dependent of each other, even though the graph would say they are independent, okay? So a semi-Markovian model is not always Markov in terms of the observables, yeah? So that's the relationship here. Okay, so far so good. Um, let's define yet again what a causal effect is, and this is Pearl's definition from his book. So suppose I'm having 
two variables x and y, or more general, two disjoint sets of variables. But in my head, it's usually a single variable that's easier, OK? Um, then we say the causal effect of x on y is characterized by the following function, which basically maps different choices of x onto the probability distribution of y, where I have the intervention that I set capital X to little x. And so this function is describing basically how x is influencing the y. OK? Sometimes also this function here is called the causal effect. Yeah? And then there are different ways to write this down. So this is the notation from Jonas Peters. Um, in Perl style, we would write it P of y given or conditioned on this do operator notation, yeah? where we could also use the shortcut just do little x if it's clear that the little x refers to the capital X. OK, so far so good. I think so. Those were so far just co some confusing definitions. OK, now determining the calcul or calculating the causal effects, yeah, if we want to solve this problem, what we have to do is we find, have to find a computable expression for this probability. OK, so that is the goal. And let's have a little quick preview. So this is some technical stuff. I show you in a second, blah, 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 blah. So here comes the answer. So parent adjustment is the solution to the problem. So we have on the left hand side an expression like the one we want. So something like, what is the probability of y given that I do something to my variable x prime? Yeah, and on the right hand side, we have an expression that only has observable probabilities. So there's no do operator anymore. And in order to be able to calculate the right-hand side, I would have y and x and all the parents of x. If they are observable, then everything is fine. And then I can use the so-called parent, ad parent adjustment formula, which is this formula here. So our goal is to derive this formula here. Let's go through the steps to do that. So first of all, we need to learn about the pre and the post interventional distribution. OK, now let's be a bit general. Let's say we have a semi-Markovian structural causal model with some observable variables x1 to xn and some noise variables u1 to un. OK, and then we have the so-called pre-interventional distribution which is just the induced distribution for my structural causal model. So nothing happened. This is just what you would observe when you don't intervene. The post-intervention distribution is the one where I now intervened on one of the variables. And basically, I have here x1 to xn, including xi. It's also on the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is really a distribution over all variables but for the situation where I intervened on one of the variables. So what do I have to do to get this distribution? I need to change the term for xi, right? Because it's set to a constant. So I replace this one factor p of xi given its parents by the Iverson bracket, okay? So this then is always zero if I'm having an xi on the left-hand side of the bar with the wrong value, okay? So it could be that my x sub i over, the, over there, x sub i might be equal to 17, but here I'm saying do x sub i set it to 18. And then basically these ones will be zero. So the small x's here are really values in a way, right? But they are referring to a particular random variable. Okay, so I just replace one factor by an Iverson bracket. So far, so good. Um, and as I say, note that this is the distribution over all variables. <coughs> However, if the xi has a wrong value, yeah, the probability is zero. And notice also that it still sums up to one. Okay, so why does it sum up to one? Anyone knows how to show this? So it's, it's something that is not super obvious. So let me let me write it on the board. Actually, it's when you see it, then you say, ah, okay, okay, fine. But um, these things are, are typically quite subtle to think about. So I just write it up, and then you see why it's the case. So I was talking about p of x1, and I switched, yes, to x2. 
and given that I said do a time prime, okay? And um, just as a note, so this is the same as the probability of x1 being x1 and so on, and there's an xi being equal to xi and so on, and an xn being equal to little xn. And then given that I said xi to xi prime. Okay, so the xi and the xi prime could be two different numbers. And this will be a distribution on all of those. And then we kind of hand gradually said this is the same as the Ivan bracket, and then times the product over all um, j being not equal to i. Okay, so this variable is three in this expression, and this is bound. Of p of xj, and then the parents of j. Okay, and now in order to show that it sums up to one, we just sum it up, boom, boom, boom. So we have summation over all possible x1, over all possible x2, and so on. So over all possible values. Okay, so this is like a, this, those are n summation signs. And then I can sort it in such a way, there must be some variables uh, which don't have any parents, right? So I can drag in the summation. So basically I, I might have, let's say without loss of generality, the innermost one is x1, so I have p of x1. So let's assume that they have the right sorting, okay? And then I'm having p of x2 given x1, and the summation over the x2, and so on. And p of xn given all the rest, and I'm having the Iverson bracket. And there is the summation over the i. So those are all the ones without the i, and this is the one with the i. Okay. And now, it is really just that this is equal to one, fine. And then this is equal to one, and so on and so forth. The term for the i is missing, fine. But it doesn't matter. I'm only summing on the left-hand side of the graph, right? So the xi might appear here on this one, but that doesn't matter, right? I'm summing up the xn. And then this term will be also equal to one. Then what about the last one? The last one goes basically, um, the summation goes over xn, so over the all possible values, right? So here I'm going over all possible values for the x. And so basically, there is one where I'm equal to the x prime, and for that one I get a one, and for all the other ones I get a zero. So the whole thing is equal to one. So it's just writing it out, but the reasoning, and then in what order, and this is kind of the difficult part here. Okay. So, um, so we have the pre-interventional distribution, which is the usual one, and then we have the post-interventional distribution where I removed one term and I put an Iverson bracket in for the other one. Okay, now using this, Notation, we can shuffle around a little bit, the, the writing. So first of all, um, instead of omitting one of the factors, I could also write the joint and divide by that factor. Okay, this is removing the factor P of xi given the parents. Um, now I can also write out the p of xi given the parents yeah, using the product rule. It's just the joint divided by p of the parents. Yeah, I just wrote out the, this uh, conditional distribution by its definition. And then I'm using the product rule for using just the first term and the bottom one to get like another conditional distribution. Okay, I'm just, first I'm... Um, don't omit the term, but I divide by it. Then I write out the definition of the conditional distribution, and then I create a new conditional distribution by shuffling the terms a little bit around. And as a result, I'm getting this expression, which, which looks already closer to what I want, where I want to get to. 
Um, however, here are some subtleties. So the xi and the parents sub i, yeah, they are also appearing on the left hand side now as conditions, right? So the last term here, that one is a bit fishy, right? So these are all fine. They are all like we know, right, what the meaning is, but this one is a bit strange. This one was was okay, right? Because the do is just creating a new distribution, kind of. But this is a little bit strange because here it's like p of a comma b given b comma c, and the question is what is the meaning of a term like that, okay? And um, let me explain that on the next slide. So I call it a lemma. So the lemma is if I condition on variables, yeah, then they can be omitted on the left hand side, and that is something that is intuitively clear that you can do it but you can also derive it. So basically by using the definition of the, of the, condi of the conditional distribution, it's the, the, the probability of the join, where I put the b twice here, because it, there is twice, and the statement up here, the p of a comma b comma b comma c, is basically the statement that p of capital A is little a and capital B is little b and capital B is little b and capital C is little c. And since the conjunction of being equal to b appears to, uh, is, can be re uh, replaced by just one equation, yeah, I, I kind of proved this equation sign, okay, which is trivial when you write it like this. It's not so trivial, I think, when you talk about conditional distributions that you can then omit it. Okay, so far so good. Um, however, there are some subtleties. Suppose we have different values, okay? So suppose the, the B appears on both sides. So we have capital B being equal to little b and capital B being equal to B prime on the condition. In that case, our conjunction is something that is only true if little b is equal to B prime, okay? So we get naturally here the Iverson brackets in here. Okay, so there are some, some subtleties. Okay, so far so good. Um, let's get back to where we were. So this was the der derivation from before, and now we know how to interpret this probability properly. So we can just omit xi and the parents of i. Okay, so it can be just um, removed. Now note, this is an expression that uses only pre-interventional distributions. Okay, so in a way, if we observe x1 to xn, and if we have the joint distribution available, then we can calculate here the thing with the do operator. So that's possible by using this expression. Um, now, suppose we are interested in a particular causal effect, so we don't want to have everyone here. So how can we translate it? And the easy trick is, of course, just sum everyone out, right? And we will see what's happening when you sum it out. Then you have the parent adjustment formula that I mentioned before. So this is the theorem. Let's look at the proof. So, uh, okay, so first some, some notations. So for uh, first of all, of course, to be more precise, the so y must be disjoint from x, right? Otherwise it's kind of, we cannot make a statement otherwise. And it must be also disjoint from the parents of x. Otherwise it also doesn't make sense to talk about this setup here. So mathematically written y intersected with x combined with the parents must be the empty set. Again, y and x are sets, but think of them as single nodes. So that's much easier, okay? Um, now the summation that I wrote here is going over all possible values of these parent x. It's like the summation we just had on the board. So it's over all possible values of x1, over all possible values of x2, and so on and so forth. Everyone who's in these parent sets. Um, what else? Now, this is only a solution to our problem if we can observe x, y, and the parents of x, right? In that case, we know all the expressions on the right-hand side, and then we can answer the question of the causal inference here. So let's, to prove it, for this, um, it's just a matter of notation, of writing everything nicely down. So um, first of all, let's give the remaining variables that we haven't mentioned. So neither y nor x 
nor the parents of x, let's give them the name w. Okay, so all my variables are now w combined with y, combined with x, combined with the parents of x. Okay, this is just a nice name. Um, and then we just marginalize out everything that we don't want to have. Okay, so we start with p of y given do x and we use the sum rule. And it also applies to something with the do operator because it's a proper probability distribution, okay? And now we kind of nicely sum out all the variables that disappeared here on the left-hand side. Next, we plug in our expression that we got using the Iverson bracket and like removing a term and then shuffling around the terms a little bit. And next, we replace x1 to xn now with our new names that we have. And those are all variables, right? There's y, w, x, and the parents of x. Those are all variables. So the w is a set of variables, possibly. S are the parents of x, but that's fine. So that's the next step. And now in the next step, we know that we can omit the x and the parents of x because we condition on them. Yeah, so we can just remove them. Fine. So this gives us already p of y, comma, a, comma w, given x and the parents of x. And this expression over here, we drag out of the summation, okay? So basically we removed these terms and we dragged out the probability of the parents in front of the two sums. Great, so far so good. Now we have a summation of y comma w and we can sum out the w. So the w disappears. And that is what we wanted to have. We wanted to have all the variables that are kind of irrelevant to the story we want we need to sum over them, over here, but then we need to get rid of them. And that's basically what we are doing here. So we end up with p of y given x. And um, what is the last step? Summing out x. Ah, okay, fine. Summing out w. Okay, now the last step is that we want to um, get rid of the last summation as well. Right, And for that one, we sum over all possible values x and note the x prime is coming from the do operator up here and the x is coming from the summation sign. So the only sum that remains is if we replace the x in the back here with an x prime. Of course, we don't replace the capital X, right? So those are this is something from the graph. So it's a capital X, a random variable. But we need to replace the little x with an x prime. And now we reorder it and that's it, so that's the formula. Okay, that is the derivation of the adjustment formula. And so the basic idea is we have derived by omitting one term and replacing it with the Iverson bracket to get an expression for this post-interventional distributions if we have all variables, yeah, and we are done if we observe them all, that's great. However, if we don't observe them all, so there might be some relevant variables like the gene or something else, yeah, then we can get rid of it by adjusting for the parents. Okay, so that is the trick here. So we have this nice theorem here. If we observe y and x and the parents of x, then we can calculate just from purely observational data the causal effect of x on y. That's already quite fascinating that that's possible. Okay, here's a more complicated example. So this is again from, from Peters. So suppose now, forget about the caption for now. So we want to calculate the causal effect of x on y, okay? And um, we know now that from the parent adjustment formula, we can just condition on the parents and multiply with the joint probability of the parents, which is in this case, C and A. And so in this complicated situation, to calculate the causal effect from x to y, all we have to observe is c, a, x, and y. That's it. The rest is irrelevant to calculate the causal effect, right? And this is the power of having such a graph thing. So in, I think from my superficial understanding of the econometrics literature, or at least how they did it more classically, they have similar adjustment formats like this, but they rarely write down the graph. I think now they start to do because Perl is very successful with it. But then arguing on what variables to adjust gets really very unclear. And it's kind of not so easy to see like here when you have the graph and you just say you just take the parent. 
However, we also see that maybe the variable C here is not really super relevant, right? I mean, that looks like something we could also get rid of. So there might be other adjustment sets. So we see that the set of parents is an adjustment set for such a formula, but there might be others, okay? And this is something we are looking at in the, in the following slides. So first of all, definition from Peters, the so-called valid adjustment set is one which fulfills exactly the formula that we've just seen. I copy and paste it here. Here, I was a bit, little bit lazy, sorry about that, so I should maybe redo this slide. This is just the parent adjustment formula if the Z are the parents. So the parents is one example of a valid adjustment set. So the other valid adjustment set are defined exactly with this equation. So if this equation holds, then Z is a valid adjustment set. It doesn't say anything about whether there exists other valid adjustment set or something. It just says, so if something fulfills this equation, we call Z a valid adjustment set, okay? It also doesn't tell us that this formula here is the only way to calculate the causal effect. And at the end of the lecture, we will see a completely different approach to calculating the causal effect. But this is one. So with these adjustment sets, it's a possibility. And seeing from the previous slide, there might be other options how to choose the set. Um, so this is the example. So Intuitively, we could omit the C, so the A should be valid too, somehow, a valid adjustment set, because kind of the, the key here is we have here some connection from X to Y, which is not going along the arrows, right? So this is the one we are going along the arrows. That is the causal effect we are interested in, and we are not interested in correlations from X to Y, which originate from some common confounder up here. And now the adjustment is doing exactly that. It's just taking the random distribution of the A, not being influenced by the X, and then calculating the effect of Y. So Y given X prime and A, basically. Okay, so somehow the, the correct formula here would be if I just use the product rule, or maybe I should, let me try to write it on the board. So we are interested in P of Y given do X or X prime often. Now let's see what's happening if we have P of Y given X. Let's play around with that expression, okay, and see what we get. So let's say there is another variable. Um, what was the letter that we had used here? Uh, okay, let's use it, let's call it A then we can introduce it by using the summation rule. So we have P of Y comma A given X. Okay, fine, that is just a summation rule. Um, and now I think I can use the product rule to write P of Y given A comma X. Okay, so times P of A given X. And here I just use the summation rule and the product rule and nothing else. Now let's compare this with the formula we got up here. So the formula we got up there was if A is a valid adjustment set, then we have something like, so they look very similar. So the only difference is P of A versus P of A given X. Okay, and let's have a little diagram here. I mean, so, well, let's use a capital A. So let's say the smoking causes cancer example. We are interested in the direct effect from X to Y, only what's going along the arrows. And we don't care for something that goes along this way, right? So if there is a common cause like the gene or whatever, and it's causing both, 
then changing the x won't change the y at all, right, if there's no direct error. So there could be a correlation between the two variables, um, even though there's no direct causal effect. So why is there information going from x to y over here? When I ask p of y given x, how is y depending on x? And we can see it from um, these formulas. So there might be this other variable a, yeah, and for the different possibilities of a, the y might, uh, so the, for example, it could be, let's say here's no error over here, then this one would be p of y given a, even, right? And the x would be gone. So it could be that all the variability in the y is directly due to the a. And then there's also some relation between a and x. Um, however, in order to, to block this path, to chop it off, yeah, we replace the distribution here, which was p of x given a, we replaced it with some p of x, or let's say the q of x, or actually we have a, we have a real name for it. So we have p of um, x given do x prime, and that distribution is just this Iverson bracket. So we made it independent of the a. Yeah, so we place the distribution down here, which actually depends on A. We replace it by a distribution which does not depend on A. And this can be seen like, okay, the A, so in order to block this path from the X to the Y, the A should not depend on the X. So if we remove that one, then we are calculating really what's happening directly with the X, how the X is directly influencing. So we kind of let the A free. So no matter what the value of x is, the a has a certain distribution, and that is used for the p of y given a and x. So somehow by omitting the given x over here, kind of we are cutting this connection. Yeah, it's a bit hand wave, but that's, that's why the formula that we get here, the adjustment formula, it's not completely arbitrary, but it's just a formula that you would get from sum and product rule then removing the influence of that variable here. So basically cutting this edge. Okay. Um, and as I said, by that we are kind of controlling this top path, right, by letting the A go and just say P of A, and the X is not influencing the A anymore. Um, and now this closing, this upper pass, it also turns into a criterion. And this is called the backdoor criterion, okay? So first of all, um, okay, let me, let me first show you what we get. So if we have a set of variables Z which closes all backdoors, whatever that means, that is a graphical criterion, then the causal effect can be calculated with our adjustment formula. And Intuitively, of course, the parents, they close all backdoors, right? Because they close, they are all incoming edges to X, and if I observe all parents, I'm closing all the backdoors. But maybe sometimes um, there are variables that don't open a backdoor to Y, and those can be omitted. So let's more formally define what a backdoor is. So a set of variables closes all backdoors from X to Y in some given graph, yeah? If the following holds, let's first look on the second one. So the second says, this set of variables that blocks every path between x and y that contains an arrow into x. Okay, so it kind of is acting like the parents, but maybe later along the path. So maybe a path from x to y goes from x to a parent of x and then to some other variables and then to y, and then along this path, I can block anywhere, and it doesn't matter whether I observe the parents or something else. So that is closing a backdoor. However, there's some other thing. So no node in Z is a descendant of X. And um, I think that that is a problem. So how is that to understand? Um, yeah, maybe we, should, we could try to draw a picture for that one. So what, is, what about the first condition? 
No node of Z is the descendant of X. Yeah, that sounds like a circle, right? So Z blocks all blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I guess I don't want to have, um, I don't want to open any paths which contain a V structure or something with Z1. I think it, the, the first condition is to ensure that I'm only above the X and not below the X, I think. But I have to check that one out. Yeah, it's an acyclic graph. That's why I'm kind of confused with the second condition, right? So the second condition, um, that it, every path must be blocked. I mean, let's we can play around with it and see whether we find an example which makes sense, where it's important. Um, let's see. Once we have it, I take a picture of it and I can put it in my lecture. Okay. So this is the setup I'm interested in and I want to close all the back doors and it is all about these paths that kind of go backwards like that. And there must be at some point an edge in this direction, otherwise I'm having a cycle, right? And now it says, so I'm talking about these nodes that are blocking the path that have some incoming at with the X. And then it says, and it should not contain any descendants of the X. And now I'm wondering, so how could this be useful to block this path here? So that's kind of strange. Without having a cycle, right? So that's a bit confusing to me. Um, but maybe there is a possibility, okay. So let's say I'm having something like that. So now my Z is really a descendant. Okay, so this is a graph without a cycle, right? And I have, uh, so this is a graph without a cycle. So far, so good. So this is good. And if I don't have the first point that the Z must not be a descendant of X, then the Z would, for example, block this path, right? However, okay, it's blocking kind of too much. So this is like a directed connection from X to Y. And this is telling me something about the causal effect on X on Y, right? So if I manipulate the X, it should also act directly, but also along this path. So this is an example. Um, so I want to avoid that I'm observing a variable which is along some possible causal connection from X to Y. Okay, so the P of um, Y given U X basically evaluates the effect of X along the arrows, right? Of course, the back doors are against the direction of arrows since I'm going upward, but it's about this connection, but it's also about a connection which would go past another variable. So I'm not allowed to use this one to block the back door pass because it would also block an interesting connection. What, what would be the argument if the Z was like one node to the left? Over here? Yeah. this. Yeah. Ah, interesting. From X to Z. Okay. There's one from here to here? Yeah. Okay, sure. That's no cycle yet, right? I don't see a cycle. Okay, it's getting more, more complicated. So now, from our criterion, it would say that it is a descendant of X, right? So this is not 
blocking the backdoor pass. Now the question is why, right? Why is it not blocking all backdoor pass? Or maybe this one is even irrelevant, right? For your for your story. Um, now yeah, in a way it is already blocked without observing it, right? So actually it's opening it. So if I if I observe CZ, then the top pass is not blocked anymore. Instead they so here I'm having a V structure. So if I observe that one, those two get in tandem. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. But it's complicated business. I don't know whether I've seen here all special cases. So it's a bit tricky, I think. And um, I'm not uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure for the second condition here. However, let me note um, this is a criterion graphs. Oh, yeah, let me know that it's a criterion on graphs, and I show it also on the screen here. So, we can ask the expert on oat and some worms and get a graph, and then by looking at the graph, we can derive some adjustment formula to calculate the causal effect. Okay, so that is the possible um, way to do it. And one way is to say, okay, I need to observe all parents of X, However, I think in the old example here, the old crap example, there is one parent Z0 that I don't observe, okay? And the question is whether there's another valid adjustment formula for this one. And for that one, I need to close all paths, okay? So which one would it be here? Which, what would be the adjustment formula? Okay, maybe it's a good idea to observe Z2 as well, right, because it's closing the path that goes directly like this. Then there's also already this path via Z3 is also closed if I observe the Z, Z2. However, there's another path, some backdoor path over the Z0, which I do not observe in the B via the Z3. So I need the Z3 as well. Okay, so the Z2 must be observed and the Z3. And possibly also there's another backdoor which is going this way but I guess that one is already closed if I'm observing the Z2. So I guess I don't need the Z1, maybe. I need to check with Pearl's book. But this is the kind of reasoning that you can do. Um, and like this, I think, is the power of these Perlian graphs in causality. Once you have the graph from your expert, then you can make a clear statement. This can be calculated. This cannot be calculated. And um, that's, that's quite fancy, I think. Okay, so here's another example where I, I shaded the area of possible backdoors. I shaded it here in this bluish tone, and I'm interested, again, in the effect from X to Y. And let's see. So the first example is X3 and X4 is closing all backdoors. Okay, X3, so I, if I go to X1, um, it's closed. X4 is ensuring that I'm also closing along this triangle and along that triangle here. However, there's another funny pass from X1, X to X1 to X4 to X2 to Y, which is open because I'm observing X4, but it's closed because I have X3, right? I need to consider all paths. So this is one pass. So X, X4 to Y, that is closed by X4. Here's another pass that is closed because of X4. And then there's this triangle pass, which is also closed because of X4 and X3. But then there's the M shape. And that one is now open because I'm observing X4, but it's closed as a location X3. X4 and X5 is another example for a similar reason, right? X4 is closing most of the paths, and the X5 is closing the M shape. And then there's, so this example that I just discussed, so just observing X4 does not close all paths because then you have this M-shaped path down here. Okay, this is spelled out what I just said with words. So there will be, of course, an exam question where you have a graph and you need to close the back doors, right? And it's not so difficult to do. It's easy points in a way when you know how to do it. Okay, 
So here comes the theorem. If I have a set that closes all backdoors, yeah, then the causal effect can be calculated using the adjustment formula. And of course, it would be curious now, and maybe I should do it at some point, um, finding out, so if I don't have this one, at what part of the proof do I need it, right? And then when I look at the derivation, there must be some spot. But these graph arguments are usually quite messy and complicated and uh, require quite a bit of thinking. OK, so far so good. So and we can also conclude the parent adjustment that kind of intuitively made sense is a special case of the backdoor adjustment because the parent adjustments are all, the parents are all non-descendants, that's point one. And we are closing all paths that are, have an incoming edge into X, right? Because we observe the parents. Good, so far so good. Now comes the question, does it already solve our smoking cancer problem? Probably not because we are not, we are not able to block this gene connection here. So we need something else. So are there other formulas to calculate the probability? And the answer is yes, there are, even, there are more formulas. So here's the example again. We cannot close this path over here because there's no parent of x that we observe, and we observe nothing else along this path here, right? So that's kind of bad. So here's the trick. Instead of talking about the back doors and adjusting for the back doors, we are kind of adjusting for the straight connections from x to y. And this will lead to the so-called front door criterion. And it's like in basketball. So there's a front door trick and a back door trick. I don't know whether you know this from basketball. OK. Um, so the trick here is now that we introduce a new variable between x and y, and then by manipulating and using that one, we can measure, measure in a way what is passing directly from x to, to, z, uh, to y via some intermediate variable. So in this story here, in the smoking and lung cancer story, we are introducing a new variable which is measuring whether there's tar in the lung, right? So that's something that can be observed, right? So you can check for a patient whether there's tar in the lung. And then there's some expert knowledge that we need that um, smoking creates tar in the lung. So that's important expert knowledge, right? We have to believe in that error. However, that is something that can be very easily checked, right? There's where should the tar come from in the lung? So there's no so other source of the tar than from the smoking, right? Otherwise, only if people eat tar you, or maybe breathe tar or something. So you can't get it easily in the lung. So there's only one explanation how to get the tar in the lung. And then the other thing is the lung or the tar in the lung must be the only possible cause of the cancer. So that's another important thing. But I think the tar is something carcinogenic thing that has the right properties. So now can we estimate the causal effect of smoking on cancer? And yes, we can by conditioning now on the new variable Z in a clever way. Um, and this is also now some technical derivation with, with some tricks. So we go through it step by step very slowly. So let's first write out the joint distribution, right? So the gene has no incoming edges, so it's just P of, P of U. The X has just the gene. The Z, so the tar variable, has just the X. And then the outcome has the tar variable and the gene. OK, so far so good. Now, after doing the intervention and summing out the additional variable X prime, kind of, we basically got rid of one of the terms. P of X given the U is now irrelevant, right? That is like chopping the incoming arrow to the X. We're chopping it off. We want to replace it with this new distribution, right? So we're saying we put it to a particular value. And now we are interested in the effect from X to Y, which can be expressed with the sum rule um, as a joint distribution where I'm having Y, Z, and U. OK, so Z was just a sum rule. And next, I'm just applying the product rule in a clever way, where I'm really just mechanically saying, um, so how did I do it? Oh, I'm just writing down, I'm replacing just this expression with the expression up here. OK, so nothing fancy happened. I just plugged it in, and I moved the summation sign 
inside. Okay, so here's nothing happened, but just using the expression after the intervention. Okay, so far so good. So those were all simple mechanical steps. And next, to calculate now this sum, or better, we need to get rid of the u, right? So that was the gene, and we want to get rid of the, it from the whole expression. We need to have some independencies that can be read off the graph. And maybe that's something we try to do on the board, okay? So I need to flip back and forth maybe. Or I can do it like this and I don't know, when I switch on the display again, I think that everyone sees only the slide. Okay, let's draw the graph. So here's the graph, this is my gene, then there's x, there's the amount of car, and then whether we got cancer or not. So this is the graph. And now comes, I need to, to check that I'm telling you the right thing. Now the first independency that we should check is that u, and that is independent given x. Okay, this is something where we use our deseparation knowledge. So the u and the z is independent given z. For that we need to check that all paths between u and z are blocked by x. So one path is going via x, and from the arrows it will be blocked if I observe the x, and the other one is the b structure. Okay, so that is the case. So what is the other one that I need? I need, um, let me copy it. Y is independent of x given z and u. So x and y, there are two paths. One is going directly via z, which is blocked by observing the z, and the other one is blocked by observing the u. Okay, so those are things that I can read off from the deseparation. So far, so good. Um, and we are interested in this term now. This term needs, ah. So we are interested in the bluish term over here, yeah? So that is the one that we want to calculate, yeah? This one here is fine, this can be observed, right? You can measure what's the probability of having tar in your lung when you are smoking, for example, or the amount of it. This term is the one that involves P of U and the U, which we cannot observe. So we need to get rid of that one. Okay, so let's start with this expression. And then at the end, we get another expression where the U is gone. Okay, let's go through it step by step to see how it goes. So first of all, um, let's use the sum rule and let's replace the P of U by the summation over p of u comma x prime. So this is now a new x which is bound to this summation sign, okay? So this is an inner x if you want to say so, right? So there's an outer x from the do x over here, but inside this expression we are talking about there is no x, we introduce a new one and write the p of u more complicated, okay? So that's the first step. In the second step, um, I'm now using the product rule. Okay, I can do that one. That's a simple step to do. Next one. Now I'm having certain independencies and I can check, uh, I can shuffle terms. So first of all, the P of the U and the Z are independent given the X. That means if I observe an X, I can also condition additionally on a Z. Yeah, that's fine. I can just condition on another variable with which I'm independent on, okay? So the first step here is to add the z because of the independence of u and z given x. Okay, and here I am given x, so I can put the z as an additional condition in here. Then the next thing is I also want to have another x prime for the p of y given z and u. And I can also z, uh, do that one because y and x are independent given that I observe z and u. So here I'm conditioning on z and u, so I can also additionally condition on x prime. Okay, so far so good? Kind of. Okay, then next let's reshuffle the terms. So let's move the p of x prime to the front and the summation 
move everything to the right. So I just moved the p of x prime, I moved it out of the summation. And then the next step is I'm here conditioning on z and x prime, and here I'm also conditioning on z and x prime. And so now by applying the product rule, I'm having the joint distribution of y and u, right? So if you would ignore the x prime and z prime, and you would ignore it here as well, you just have p of y given u times p of u. And so that is the dis joint distribution of p of y and u. But now conditioned on x prime and z. Fine. Now we are done, because now we're just marginalizing this conditional distribution and getting rid of the u. And this looks a bit like magic. However, the thing is, what we did here is, we, in this, with these independencies, we substituted the x prime into this independence, and then later on got rid of the u. And then x prime takes the role of the u. Right? So here it was important for having the right distribution of the y to know the value of u, and we replace it by knowing the value of x prime. And so that is the trick, kind of. But we have to sum out, sum out over all possibilities for the x prime. Okay? So we have introduced here the x prime as a new variable, um, and we go through all possibilities, and by that we are also going through all possibilities of the, of the u. So in a way, the x prime and the u, they contain similar information. And by putting a variable here, which is independent, then reshuffling term and summing out the other one, they kind of switch the roles. OK, fancy. So instead of summing over the u, which was here our expression to start with, we can alternatively sum over the x prime, which is pretty surprising that this works. But I hope every step was clear, but I think the result is still a bit overwhelming, at least to me, that you can do it. OK, great. So what do we get? Where, did we, where were we before we went to this derivation? We already were at the point where we said that the p of y given do x is this complicated expression where we have a summation over all possibilities of u. And we replace this summation now with a summation over x prime. OK. So let's rewrite this. So now this is our new formula. And when we look at it, we see p of the tar, given smoking or not, is something we can observe. Then we have a probability distribution about people smoking. And we have a probability distribution about um, people getting cancer, given that they are smoking and that they have tar in their lung. Okay. So the derivation is very technical, and also the result is very non-intuitive that you suddenly can calculate something like that. But the trick is we are kind of going like the front door. So it's somehow by observing a lot of information where we know for sure this is along the front door, we can exclude the top part. Yeah? So by the front door calculation, we are ensuring that we're only looking for, um, yeah, for correlations that passes along the errors. So this variable z now blocks the so-called front doors from x to y. And it has no connection to the back doors. So that's the basic story. Okay, It's not influenced by the gene. So there's no weird correlation between those. But the z is really only directly influenced by the x. And the z is directly influencing the y. There might be also, I think, a direct connection from x to y, I think. But now it, it needs to be close. Okay. So the, the set of variables fulfills the front door criterion if z closes all front doors from x to y. That means z closes all directed paths from x to y. So there cannot be a direct path from x to y. Then the formula wouldn't work. Okay? And the reason why that's the case, because the direct connection cannot be distinguished from the back doors. However, the front doors can be distinguished because we condition on the z as well. And then we are sure that we are going via the z. And we are ignoring the, the top part. Then there are some more technical ones. There's no unblocked backdoor path from x to z. Okay, Instead of having a path from x to y, now we have an intermediate variable. And we are asking for backdoors from x to this intermediate variable. And those must be blocked as well. And all other black, black doors from z to y are closed by x. 
let's look at this in at, at the at the board again. So um, so for the front door criteria, the Z must block all directed passes from X to Z. And those are the ones that we are kind of, we want to cover, that we want to measure. And we measure it by, then in the formula, which is non-intuitive to me, by kind of conditioning on the Z, we ensure that we are really going this way, okay? Um, the second was, there's no backdoor from um, X to Z, yeah? so there's no, I think it's approximately no backdoor from X to Z. So if I would have a connection like this, it wouldn't work anymore. Yeah, then there could be some other weird thing. And if this error would violate one of these, okay, one of the independencies that I needed to exchange, because basically what I did is I exchanged the role of U, I exchanged it with, with the X. And if I have this direct connection, these are violated and I can do it. So the backdoor, there shouldn't be a backdoor from X to Z, only a direct connection. And now the other thing is there shouldn't be a backdoor from Z to Y, but the one that goes via X. Okay, of course there is a backdoor from Z to Y, and it's going via the X, right? But this one is allowed. So that is three, um, no backdoors. from Z to Y, but one near the X. Okay, and as before, it was in the parent adjustment, for example, we are controlling this upper part by changing the distribution of the U. It's no longer P of U given X, as would the formula suggest, but it's only P of U. So it should freely um, develop independent of the value of x, really cutting this one if I change the distribution up here. So that was the backdoor trick. And the front door trick, I'm kind of saying I can control, I'm, I'm interested in these errors here, and now I can, can really pinpoint these errors by having this additional variable here that has these nice properties of being independent of the possible backdoors that are out there. That's like the, like an intuitive explanation. But there's one thing to go through the steps and to say, yeah, I understand every step, and then to have a really deeper understanding. And I'm also lacking this deeper understanding. I can tell these stories here, but there's, I think there's more to understand about this mechanism here, how this formula really works. So for me, it's really replacing the summation over the U with the summation over, over all possible values of X, right? which is curious because there is another fixed x in here as well. But in order to get the right result, I also need to sum out over all possibilities of the x prime, which is kind of unusual. So there's an x and an x prime, which makes it very special. Okay, and this can be applied to the smoking cancer example. And we are run already over time, but luckily we are at the end. But just as a very little preview, next time we will look at the do calculus, which sounds fancy, and it will answer the following question. So, so far, we've seen the front door and the back door criteria, and they allow us now to calculate certain causal effects given only observational quantities. Of course, the question is, are those all formulas that are outside, or are there more formulas? So there's the back door, the front door, maybe there's even something more fancy, or combination thereof. And the answer will be, if there are, we can derive them with the so-called do calculus, okay? And this is a formalism that allows us to derive possible expressions for the do notation without using the do operator, but only observational quantities. And this will be looked at next time. Okay, so far so good. That's it for today. And I see you next week, I think, online only, right? In the Zoom session, okay. So thanks for your attention. And bye-bye.